Aren't you glad our soul is anchored in the Lord? extend a thank you to um, Brother Blackson. He's been my right hand man. I've been gone and he calls me and let me know what's going on. All right, come. So I just like to thank Brother Blackson for all he does and um, he continue doing it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, continue to pray for Sister Lee and then I uh, got news. Um, Sister Connie's husband died. So it was seven weeks, right? Seven weeks, uh, he passes away. So, uh, you know, reach out to the family if you can, um, if you will, um, just to show that we love you. And so we love the family. Amen? Um, coming to a conclusion of this week and, and maybe in one more Sunday um, of our study in the summer of 1 John. In 1 John. So um, this morning we're going to look at 1 John chapter 4. We're only going to look at two verses, 1 John chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 17 and 18. And I want us to look at these particular two verses from the vantage point. Drive the fear out and live. Drive the fear out of your life and live. So if you would stand with me, I want us to look at 1 John chapter 4. Get my glasses. Verses 17 and 18. And from the NIV, it reads this way this morning. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fear is not made in love, the perfect love. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for each and every soul that's here today. Lord, we thank you for what you continue to do in this church. Lord, we thank you for what you continue to do in this community and in this nation. Lord, we ask that you continue to put your arm of protection around each and every one of us. Lord, we ask you to continue to guide us and lead us to where we need to go. Lord, I ask you that I decrease so that you can increase. And Lord, I ask that you open us up so that we can receive a word from the Lord today. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. Drive the fear out and live. Now, I have taught high school for over 27 years and have been in ministry with all types of people for a long time. And in doing so, I have learned that fear is perhaps the number one reason why people don't live up to their fullest potential. You see, fear oftentimes is the cause of unfulfilled and lackluster lives many people live. You see, living a life of fear can be emotionally, physically, spiritually exhausting. You see, it restricts one's ability to fully engage with life, pursue goals, and experience joy. D did you know that fear is a joy sucker, a, a goal killer, and a commitment destroyer? You see, fear sucks the joy, the fulfillment, and the meaning from your life. Now, I, I know there might be some of you out there this morning saying to yourself, Preacher, this message has nothing to do with me because I, I'm not afraid of most things in life. I, fear doesn't have me. And, and yes, it's true. Most people might not label their inaction 
or, or, or procrastination or perfectionism or even their stagnation in life as being caused by fear. But you need to know that fear has many faces. And so I'm here this morning to let you know that behind the many reasons why you don't do what you need to do to be all that God wants you to be is more often not fear. You see, fear of failure, fear of embarrassment. You see, oftentimes we get fearful, fearful of the unknown, fearful of, of being left alone, fear of rejection, fear of death, fear of being discovered that you are not who you say you are. Fear of confrontation. You see, some people even fear God. So managing your fear might be the key that unlocks the door to the next level in your life, your, your, your ministry or even your relationships with others. You see, people who live in fear constantly, if it's not checked, uh, and it might just be in one area of your life, it causes a sense of apprehension, dread, and worry about the potential negative outcome in that situation. An article I read a few weeks ago listed some common ways in which fear might appear its ugly head in your personal life. Now, the, the, the article talks about how fear can manifest itself in avoidant behavior. You see, when people are afraid of something, they go to great lengths to avoid situations, places, and even people, afraid that something bad will happen. I, I read somewhere that it says that people don't get the jobs they want because they are fearful of rejection, that they d d don't even network with other people who might give them access to jobs because that they are afraid of what people might do. That, you see, people don't even apply for jobs thinking that they will not get the response they want. Now, I know people who, who don't start businesses or ask people out on dates or even go to the doctor because they're too scared of the answers they might receive. And then the article goes on to say that some people who, who live fearful lives, it, it leads to a negative thought pattern, self-doubt, and self-defeating thinking. This type of person always focuses on the worst case scenario or exaggerated negative outcomes in life. You, you do know that you can think yourself into failure. That's why the Bible says that we should think on these things, things that are good, and righteous. I, I, I know people who always think and talk negatively, are always afraid of something bad is going to happen, and then they get surprised when the very thing they think was going to happen happens, and then they say, I, I told you so, which reinforces the negative thought patterns that they have. You see, we have learned throughout this series of sermons on the book of 1 John that what you think about matters because what you think about is oftentimes what you act out in life and then the article goes on to say that fear not only leads to self-defeating thinking but it also can lead to self-defeating actions in our lives that produce negative outcomes such as procrastination and social isolation and perfectionism Fear of failure or, or, or perfectionism can lead to procrastination as a way of avoiding the feared situations people know they have to fix or resolve. You, you see, some people don't come to church or, or, or quickly leave right after church because th they don't want to face the person or people that they need to speak to to resolve that conflict, that, that they know it's eating them up on the inside of them, but they're too afraid of what's going to happen. What I see in church a lot are people who are fearful of confrontation, which can cause a person to isolate themselves from social situations and void interaction with others due to fear of judgment or embarrassment or disagreement. But did you know that sometimes that's the very thing a person needs to grow in Christ? Confrontation. It's the jolt that moves us away from procrastination and stagnation and life paralysis. You see, sometimes we need to conf confront our fears. So, so the question I want you to ask and answer this morning is, what is it in your life that you are afraid of 
that might be keeping you from receiving God's blessing in your life. God might be ready to, to, to be ready to drop down a blessing right here and now, but you're too scared to move, too, too afraid to walk through the doors God has opened just for you. That, that, that job, that, that relationship, that money opportunity, or even that ministry idea, it, it might be ready, uh, God might be ready to put it right into your lap, but you're too scared of failure to step out on faith to get what God has for you. So I, I'm here this morning to, to urge you, to, to, to control you, to start to move this morning in the direction of the way God wants you to move. Let's be honest with ourselves. How much time do we really have? You, you see, life is finite. You, you, you may uh, uh, go see God before God uh, uh, has fulfilled what he has on the inside of you. Now, you do need to know that fear is a natural emotion that, that serves to protect us from potential threats. However, when fear becomes excessive or, or, or irrational or stops us from doing or being what God uh, wants us to be, it can have detrimental impact on the quality of your life. That's why I think John talks about fear in our text this morning. So let's look at our text and see what John says about fear and how to handle it in a way that is more productive and meaningful in our lives. Now, if you look at the text again, in verse 17 it says, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. And so John starts this section of the text by making it very clear that as followers of Christ, we are called to live a life without fear, anchored to the perfect love of God. So, so, so this is the first thing that we need to understand when we look at this text for application this morning, is love has the power to drive out fear in our lives. Now, you, you, you need to be reminded that although fear is a natural response to the unknown, the uncontrollable, and the threatening, but it can paralyze us, hinder us, and, and stop our growth, and even prevent us from experiencing the fullness of life that God intends us to have if not controlled and guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 17 tells us how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. And then verse 18 tells us that there is no fear in love. So these two verses give us the message that perfect love drives out fear because the cause of fear that John is talking about is connected to the anticipation of punishment on the day of judgment. And then in the context of verse 17, we see that John is connecting the day of judgment and fear. Now, the Bible, now, you Bible students know that the day of judgment is when all people will be made accountable for their sins. And for the non-Christian, it will be the day of paying the price for not accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which will be eternity without God in a place called hell full of demons and the devil where there will be pain and regret for eternity. So, so in the context of verse 17, we see that fear is associated with negativity. So, so Christians should know that, that, that only God's love can combat that type of negativity in our lives. T -t -t take notice of the principle here. It is that perfect, the perfect love of God and worldly fear cannot coexist, and that the love of Christ was able to fix our sin problem. You see, when Christ died and rose again, the penalty of our sin was paid, and therefore the Christian should have no fear on the day of judgment. So, so we see we cannot love like Christ 
and be full of fear because the love of God fixed all our problems. And, and, and that should be good news for us today, that, that we have no fear of judgment because the penalty of sin is death, destruction, and despair. But when Jesus came and lived uh, and, and died and rose again, all that penalty was paid at the cross. So, so that should free us up this morning. And, and that's a word for all of us here this morning. Stop letting fear block the way you love others. You, you see, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that love dictates that we act in ways that the world tells us, teaches us, and communicates to us that that type of godly love that, that, that God wants us to show towards other people, it goes against the norms of this world. So, so this text is telling us that it takes a person who is not too scared to move against the current of the world to love like Christ. You see, love dictates that we be bold in our love towards others so that our actions push others to Christ. You, you, you can't be too scared to be kind to people. You can't be too scared to be the kind of Christian God can use to love and do big things for God. You, you see, we need to be reminded that the church is a hospital for those who are spiritually sick. It should be a place where those who are spiritually sick can come and get well. So, so love dictates that we cannot be surprised when sick people show up at church and act sick. You, you see, sick people do what they do. They're, they are sick. Their soul is sick. So you see, some of us get mad because some, some sick folk don't act like church folk. But sick folk don't act like sick folk. And, and so we need to be reminded that our job is to be disciplined enough so that we can disciple sick folk so that they can get well. And if we can't help them personally, we should at least be mindful enough where we aren't too scared to intertwine our lives with other people's lives so we can guide them to the places and the people so that they can get well. Now, the reality of it is, though, some folks say they're the sick ones. But the reality is we all sick. And if we understand that if we all sick, you, you will be more mindful of sick people around you. You see, all of us are sick. So, so we, we need to stop complaining that you, you see people who act and sick and say, this church is a mess. Or, or all these people, you, you, you know how they say it. I'm not saying you say it, but I'm saying some people say it, that all these people running around here acting sick. You, you, you know what they say. We, 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 you, you know, but we're called to not complain, but to do. Because love is an action word. So if you want to be like Christ, stop talking about sick people and start helping them out. You, you, you do know that as church leaders, though, and, and, and as I said all that, and for you church folk who've been around church for some time, you need to have some semblance of wellness in your life so that you can help others in need. See, we can't all be sick all at the same time. There should be some areas in our lives that we are well enough that we can help someone else so that we should be able to help people in church and we should lift people up where we are strong and then people should lift us up where we are weak. You see, because we all are sick with a disease called sin. And so God is calling us to be part of the kingdom, to edify one another. What, what I'm saying is, if you can't keep a man, you might not need to be the person that helps others when it comes to relationships. 
but you might be able to help someone in the area of finance because you have your finances under control. But what I'm trying to say is you can't be too scared to help others. And sometimes helping others might just mean telling the truth in love about what other people need to do to grow. And if you're sick, don't complain when somebody tells you what you might need to get well. You, have you ever been to the hospital and you've seen those, those, those people who come in drunk and all kind of, and they fight in the doctor to try to get the medicine? The doctor says, just hold on, let, let me get you a painkiller or whatever you need. And, and they just, just, just outright mean and nasty. But what if the doctor just gave up and says, okay, let's just send them out? But that, that's sometimes what we do as children of God. We got sick people running in and here acting sick, and we get mad at them, instead of saying, how can we help you? And, and, and even when we suggest a little help, they get a little nasty and ugly. But when they get too ugly, we say, okay, no, you got to go. <laughs> but what we are called to do, just like a doctor, be calm, go back to our training, put them in the bed, sedate them if we have to, and give them the help they need. Because the reality is, we all are sick. And it might be one day that you might be the very person who's fighting the doctor. And you might need a strong doctor to say, sit down. I'll sedate you if I need to, because you need to get the medicine you need. So the question I have for you this morning is, which one? are you going to allow to control, dictate, and tell you how to act in life? Fear or love? You see, one leads to death, destruction, distraction, and despair, while the other one leads to a life full of joy, peace, fulfillment, even when things around you are not positive or happy. That's what the love of God will do in your life. He will, it will surround you in every situation you find yourself in. You, you see, love gives us hope to know that God's perfect love dictates that all things work together for his good and ours in the end. Because we are sons and daughters of God. We, we have been grafted into the family. We have been grafted into the kingdom of God. We, we are part of God's loving family. And, and so we need to understand that God has our back. Now, 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 your confidence in and what God can do should push the fear of anything in your life out. In these two verses, John explains how perfect love leads to a lack of fear. Now, here's how he breaks it down. The passage begins by starting when love is made complete among believers. The, the believers will have confidence on the day of judgment. And, and this confidence comes from being in a relationship with Jesus and aligning themselves and their lives to God's teaching so that they will know and be free from the penalty of sin, death, and destruction. And, and not only that, the Bible students here know that true love equals the elimination of all fear that is associated with the possibility of hell, death, and the devil when you die. And, and that's freeing and, and should give the believer confidence that they can overcome anything in this world. And, 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 so, and then John points to the key point of the passage, which is that even though that there is no fear in love, it doesn't mean that a person will never experience fear in their lives. But, but, but rather that fierce power and hold and control over their hearts and their mind is diminished by the very presence of the perfect love of God. What, what, what are you saying, preacher? In, in other words, the more faith you have in God, the less fear will you have towards the things of this world. You, you see, these two verses also tell us 
that when someone experiences and understands the depths of God's perfect love for us, our fear of judgment, punishment, and condemnation is alleviated, which in turn instills in us the fearlessness that we need that will complete any task that God has for us. And this is because love and fear are contrasting emotions. When genuine love is present, fear loses its grip on our heart. I, I, I remember when, when I was about eight or nine years old, and my, my mother worked in Arcadia as an independent cleaning lady to pick up some extra money. And one day, she left me and my twin brother at home by ourselves. And she said, don't worry, my friend is going to come over and babysit you. A and the first hour passed, and we kind of were around. And then the second hour passed, and still no babysitter. A a and then I, I remember when her friend didn't show up, uh, my brother and I started to panic. W what about lunch? W what, what are we going to eat? What are we supposed to do? We've never been home by ourselves. And just when our panic was going to explode, our mother called. And just the sound of her voice calmed us down. Now, we were still in the same situation. We were still in the same condition. We were still alone by ourselves. But just the sound of our mother's voice calmed us down. And then she began to instruct us what to do until my sister got home. She, she says, calm down, go, go in the shelf, stay away from the stove and the oven, get some crackers and some cookies, and sit in front of the television until your big sister comes home. The, you, you see what I'm saying? The situation didn't change, but the mother's love calmed us down. And then when we did what our mother said, do, because we had faith that she loved us enough to give us the right instructions, we, we sat in front of television until our sister came home and nothing happened to us. And that's all I'm saying to you today, is that when you are in the midst of a situation or a circumstance, calm down, listen to the small voice of God in your heart and your mind, and follow the directions of God, and see how God will move in your life. So, so stop praying that the situation and the circumstances will change all time, all the way. Because sometimes God will have you in a situation, a circumstance, to grow you. But you need to know that when you're in that circumstance, in that situation, God is there just for you. And, and you can't be too scared, too afraid to move. Because if we were too afraid, to scared to move, when our mother said, go and get some cookies and some crackers out of the shelves, and we said, Mom, we can't do it. What would the situation look like? We still would have been all right, but we would have been hungry. We would have been upset. And we probably would not have been as happy watching television without our food. And that's just like some Christians. We go through some circumstances and some situations. And God tells us what we need to do. But we too stubborn. We, we, we too big headed to listen to God. But God loves us enough. He said, I'm, I'm going to get you out of this situation. I'm going to get you out of this circumstance. But you aren't going to leave the situation as comfortable as you could have if you just listened to me. You, you, you see... We need to understand that fear is the devil's tool to get us from or stop us from doing what God wants us to do. And so when we submit to God's word, the fear will not only vanish, but we will get through the circumstances in our lives much better. And the next thing we see in the text, I, I got about four minutes. Maturing in love affects the way you see God in your life and what he can do for you. You see, John's words suggest that fear is a sign of incomplete spiritual maturity. You see, we can infer from the text that as we grow in our understanding of God's love, 
fear diminishes because the more we learn about God and his power, not just in the world around us, but in our personal lives, the more we trust in God and what he can do for us and the less afraid of the things around us that we experience. What are you trying to say, preacher? I got to cut through my notes and tell you. The point is, we need to trust God enough to do what he says, even when it doesn't look like where we're going, it would be profitable to do so. What are you talking about, preacher? I listen to a lot of podcasts, and a lot of these podcasts today, they have no concern about God in their lives where it doesn't agree with them. What are you talking about? There's a lot of young Christians who are good Christians, who go to church, who do all the things that church people do, but have sex before marriage. There are some good people who go to church and do all kind of church things, but they gamble, they drink too much, they do drugs, they do all those kind of things. And they say, God, just ignore this one part or one area in my life. If you just give me this area and let me do what I want to do, I'll do whatever you need to do over here. But the Bible tells us that God wants all of us. See, see, have you ever wondered why you're not as fulfilled in life, that, that you may have not gotten to your goal? It might be that area in your life that you are not willing to give to God. You, you, you know, there are people say, you know, I, that, that's, we're in 2023. I, why am I shouldn't I have sex? Because you are binding your soul to someone else that you're not married to. And then you get mad and upset when the next person you get, there's all kind of baggage. You, you, you get upset because you don't be a good steward of your money. And, and you can't pay all your bills every month. And, and God says, you need to give even when it hurts. You see, you can't afford not to give. And, and, and I challenge you today, when you give, when you don't think you can give, see how God will move in your life. You see, the world has all kinds of remedies about how to fix their problems or your problems. But you need to have faith enough in God, even though in the world it looks like silly. If you ask people about, about, about how Christians interact in the world, they say, that's silly. Well, why are you doing that way? But if you just buckle down, have faith enough in God, and see how God will work. I, I got so much more, I'm just going to have to stop it right there because we got communion. So I might pick it up next week, I don't know. Amen? Amen. Sunday school, <laughs> get inside that class. Will there be anyone here today that is looking to be a member of Community Baptist Church? If you're without a church home today, I know you're looking for it. If you're without a church home, I know you're looking for it today. I think we are going to tell you. Will there be? 
it's communion today. <laughs> we got communion. <laughs> I thought we were going to do this. Okay, okay. Amen. As they prepare the table, I want to remind us from um, Isaiah 53 um, what Jesus has done for us. Let's get it. Let's get it together. <laughs> it says from Isaiah 53, who has believed our reports and whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry.